Welcome back. Uh, what we're going to do in this video is talk uh, at least about the first part of tyrosine kinase receptors. So let me go ahead and get my brush on. Okay, so what we're going to do in this video is talk about tyrosine, tyrosine kinase receptor. Okay, now in most situations, you usually hear it referred to as receptor tyrosine kinase. Now, these are the same thing, okay? So, receptor tyrosine kinase. So, for abbreviation, if I need to abbreviate it, I'm going to abbreviate RTK. Now, I usually refer to them as tyrosine kinase receptor. It doesn't really matter how you refer to them, um, but we're talking about the same thing. Now, what I'm going to try to convince you in this video is that if you if you if you're watching this video most likely you've already seen some videos on YouTube okay and what I need to tell you is that the videos on YouTube the other ones not this one obviously but the other ones are probably the most poorly explained um, function of the tyrosine kinase receptor at least the first half of it okay and the reason it's poorly explained is because it's incorrect okay um, the actual mechanism of the tyrosine kinase receptor is very different than what is explained on pretty much all the videos on YouTube um, that I have seen, at least. At least the ones that pop up first when you type it in. Okay. Now, to understand the function of the tyrosine kinase receptor, we have to essentially be looking at the membrane. So I'm going to draw a small membrane right here. Okay. And what I'm going to denote is the top side, we'll say, is the extracellular side. And this side is the cytosolic side, okay? Extracellular side, okay? And normally, uh, the tyrosine kinase receptor exists as a monomer, okay? So it exists as a monomer, okay? And so the first subunit we have is this out here in the extracellular side. This is your alpha subunit, okay? And it turns out that the alpha subunit is involved in the actual binding of the ligand. Okay, the ligand, recall from previous videos, is just the is the the molecule that a particular protein binds. Okay, and and ligand is usually used in um, when we're talking about um, components of a protein that are non-catalytic. The catalytic part of this protein is the cytoplasmic part. Okay, and so what we have is we have a beta subunit. Okay. And the beta subunit spans both the membrane and go, uh, jets into the cytosol. Okay, so this uh, protein exists as an alpha beta, has an alpha subunit and has a beta subunit. Okay, like I mentioned, the alpha subunit ordinarily is what binds um, is what ordinarily binds the ligand. Okay. And the beta subunit is actually what possesses the catalytic activity. And specifically, the catalytic activity is done by the cytosolic part of the beta subunit. Okay. Now, um, ordinarily, there's just, you know, there's a there's a, an, an array of these proteins that exist. Uh, let me do this. There's an array of proteins that exist in the membrane, you know, at various locations. Okay. So they have alpha subunits and they have beta subunits. So normally what's really critical to understand about these, about these proteins is they exist as monomers. Okay? I don't know if I mentioned that already, but they exist as monomers. Okay? Now, what I'm going to do in this video and actually the other videos that I'm going to do on this, I'm going to break this up into separate videos, is I'm going to use insulin as an example. So if we were talking about the tyrosine kinase receptor for insulin, we'd just call it the insulin receptor. Okay? Now... Again, one other thing that's incorrectly done in uh, most videos is they show insulin as a monomer. Okay? Insulin is not a monomer. Okay? When insulin is first synthesized and it leaves the pancreas, it actually dimerizes. And the reason insulin dimerizes is because the actual uh, primary structure of insulin, well, when it folds into its tertiary structure, actually what happens is there's a if it was a monomer, there'd be a very large hydrophobic segment of it, okay? Now, you can imagine that the blood, where it's traveling, is very polar, right? Blood is mostly water, right? At least the fluid component's mostly water. Water is polar, hydrophilic. And if I asked you, do you think it would be thermodynamically favorable for a hydrophobic segment to interact with water, what would you say? 
And your answer should be no. It, it therm be thermodynamically unfavorable. So what insulin, what it actually happens is insulin, when it when it travels in the blood, it exists as a dimer. Okay. And what insulin does is it has to find a way to get two tyrosine kinase receptors in close proximity. Okay. So what you have to imagine is, let's say I do insulin, I'm going to do it in green. Okay. Insulin, I'll do it like this to illustrate it as a dimer. Okay. So each one of those uh, shapes represents dimer or at least an individual monomer and together it's a dimer okay so what you have to re wait to think about is obviously okay obviously this sub this monomer of insulin is going to interact with one of the alpha subunits right the alpha subunit is what binds a particular monomer of insulin but somehow i've got to get this uh, monomer of insulin to interact with this subunit of the other uh, tyrosine kinase receptor monomer okay but at some point, they're too far apart to interact. But ultimately, what we're going to see happen is that the um, tyrosine kinase receptor monomers are going to dimerize. Okay. Now, you have to imagine that uh, the dimer um, of, of insulin okay, is going to be coming into close proximity with two um, tyrosine kinase receptors that are not dimerized yet, but they're in, they're in fairly co close proximity. And as the insulin dimer gets closer and closer, there is sort of a thermodynamically favorable movement of the insulin uh, receptor monomers to, to um, force them together. Okay, So as the dimer of insulin gets closer and closer to two of those monomers okay, of the tyrosine kinase receptor, there's a negative delta G um, thermodynamically favorable process in which they come together. Okay, so what you end up getting is you have to picture. I'm not going to draw it, but you have to picture that both the beta subunits come closer together and the alpha subunits. Okay, and so what you'll see, and I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll go ahead and do this and draw the. Actually, you know what? Let me just go ahead and draw it. Okay, just for the purposes here, I'll go ahead and draw it. What you have to picture is that you have your two alpha subunits now, right next to each other, right. And then you have your beta subunits, right, spanning the membrane into the cytosol, right, and they're dimerized like this. And then you would basically have your insulin dimer like this, okay? There's your insulin dimer. And now you have the tyrosine kinase receptor monomers in a dimeric form, okay? This effectively activates the tyrosine kinase receptor. Now, what I want to be perfectly clear about is, well, actually, first let me do this, okay? Let me say this, okay? What you have on these, let, let me actually blow this up, okay? Let me come down here and sort of expand this, okay? I'm just going to draw like this, okay? These are going to be your beta subunits, okay? And specifically, these are the are these cytoplasmic components, okay? Now, you have to, let, let, let's just name these. So if I, if I was to come up here and call this beta 1 and beta 2, okay, for each monomer, this will be beta 1 and this will be beta 2, okay? Now, what you have to picture is that, um, these are just amino acid uh, peptide chains, right? They're proteins. So what you have is, is you have on each of these, you have tyrosine residues, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and draw three of them. And what you'll find is that there are three critical tyrosine residues in each the beta-1 and the beta-2, okay? So there are three critical tyrosine residues, okay? Now, note that there are also, because these, mo because these monomers are exactly the same um, three-dimensional and primary structure, there also exists three on beta-2, but I'm just going to omit them here for now. But no, there are three tyrosine residues on the beta-2 subunit, okay? And that, that squiggly line just represents it's part of the chain, okay? Now, whenever you dimerize receptor tyrosine kinases, okay, what happens is that in each of the beta-1 and beta-2 subunits, there's a, there's a kinase domain that becomes activated. Okay, so a tyrosine kinase, uh, the actual kinase domain, the catalytic domain becomes activated. Okay, what does that mean? Well, what's a, we, we recall what a kinase is. A kinase is essentially a phosphotransferase, right? It's a phosphotransferase. So what ends up happening is this. So ATP is going to be allowed into the active site of the other beta subunit. So you're going to have let me do it like this. I'm going to abbreviate the rest of the structure, but here's your ADP, and here's the phosphate that's attached, right? So you have an ATP that's allowed into the active site of, say, in this case, the beta-2, 
right? Now you have to you have to consider if the beta two active site becomes activated, right? Beta one is the substrate, right? Beta one is the substrate, and so specifically the substrates are these these three tyrosine residues in here, okay? Now, I'm just drawing one ATP for now, but note that in total, there would be three, um, there would be three ATPs that were allowed into the active site of beta two. And so what you would get is you get a nucleophilic acyl substitution reaction. So there's a lone pair on the oxygen of the tyrosine, and it's going to act as a nucleophile. And so it's gonna attack here, you get a nucleophilic acyl substitution reaction, and then ADP is your leaving group, right? Picks up a proton as it leaves, okay? And so what you get is you get a phosphorylated tyrosine residue in the beta-1 subunit. And what you would see is that you would actually get that for all three of the tyrosines in the beta-1, okay? So what I can show here, actually let me let me do it down here, okay? So what you would ultimately get, so if I come over here and I redraw the betas, right? So here was beta one, uh, beta one, this is beta two, okay? If I have my critical tyrosine residue right here, now it's gonna be as a phosphotyrosine. I'm abbreviating the phosphate, right? But assuming beta two, has done its complete catalysis, you end up with three phosphorylated tyrosine residues. Okay? I hope that makes sense. So you get three phosphorylated tyrosine residues. Now, one thing we want to consider is that remember that these, uh, these subunits for each of the monomers of the tyrosine kinase receptor, they're identical. So you have to imagine that also there are three tyrosine residues on the beta 2 subunit. Right, of the second monomer. So if there are three tyrosine residues there, then there is also a tyrosine kinase domain on the beta-1 subunit. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here, over to the left side. I left some space. Okay? So let's say that, um, what did I do? I did, so in this case, I said beta-2 was the catalytic site. Okay, so in this case, over here, we're going to say that beta-1 is the catalytic site, okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to phosphorylate. We're going to phosphorylate the beta-2, okay? So beta-1 is now the catalytic domain. So now what you have to realize is, again, there are tyrosine residues that stick off of here, right? Tyrosine residues on the beta-2, right? And I can keep drawing them, right? There are, again, three tyrosine residues on the beta-2 subunit, right, of the second monomer, right? And, again, remember that these monomers of the tyrosine kinase receptor are identical, right? So we're effectively going to have the exact same mechanism, right? So, again, this oxygen of what the tyrosine residue is going to do a nucleophilic attack on the gamma phosphate, right? Pi bond kicks up, kicks back down and ADP is your leaving group, right? Again, it's the same mechanism, except this time you have to picture the tyrosine residues are on the beta-2 subunit, and the, or I should really say the beta subunit of the um, second monomer that we labeled beta-2, and then the beta-1, the beta subunit of the first monomer of the tyrosine kinase receptor, that's the actual catalytic domain. And again, you do the exact same mechanism for this one, this critical tyrosine residue. So nucleophilic attack of the gamma phosphate, pi bond kicks up, reforms, and ADP is your leaving group. So you can guess what we're going to do on the third tyrosine of the beta-2, right? The beta-1 subunit is going to catalyze nucleophilic acyl substitution, pi bond kicks up, right? pi bond reforms and you kick off ADP as your leaving group. So in total, in total, okay, in total, when we fully activate these tyrosine kinase receptors, what happens? When we fully activate them, we end up burning six ATP and we end up generating six leaving groups, all of which are ADP. So if I come over here and I draw our final product, it's going to look something like this. Okay, and just bear with me with this for a minute.
Okay. Again, this over here was our beta subunit of the first monomer of the tyrosine kinase receptor. This was our second one, right? So what do we have? Well, we have, we're going to have, in each case, we're going to have, right, we're going to have three phosphotyrosines, right? And those phosphate groups, remember, are added by the catalytic domain of the opposite of the opposite beta subunit, right? So there's a phosphotyrosine on the second monomer. Here's the second one. And again, we have a third one, okay? Now, what was the whole purpose in adding these phosphates to these tyrosines? In other words, generating three phosphotyrosines on each beta subunit. Now, remember that we've dimerized, and so, and so these, are in, these beta subunits are in really close proximity. Well, it turns out that there are certain proteins that are good at docking to phosphates, okay? And this is going to be explored more in a later video, okay? It's probably going to be the next video. But there are certain proteins, okay, that can dock to these phosphates that are attached to the tyrosine, okay? One of these proteins that's especially good at doing that is called IRS1, okay? And it turns out that IRS1 is the initial... It's the initial protein that's found in the insulin, um, the insulin biosignaling cascade pathway. So the point is that it doesn't really matter which, um, which hormone we're talking about. Um, it just matters that we understand that there are certain proteins that once phosphorylated, or once the tyrosine kinase receptors are phosphorylated, docking proteins that are specific for these phosphotyrosines can attach. Okay, and we'll explore that in a later video. Okay, but suffice it to say for now, let's do a quick recap because this is absolutely critical. Okay, insulin, we're doing insulin as an example. Insulin exists as a dimer, and essentially when it binds, it causes these two tyrosine kinase receptor monomers to dimerize, right? And when they dimerize, that essentially activates the tyrosine um, kinase domain, actually the actual catalytic domain of each beta subunit, okay? And the beta subunit uh, binds ATP and phosphorylates three tyrosine residues on the opposite beta subunit, okay? And, and so you get three phosphotyrosines in each beta subunit, and that basically allows docking proteins like IRS1 to bind. Now, in, in the videos on YouTube, what they typically show is, okay, you'll have some, you know, you'll have some beta subunit, right? And you'll have your tyrosine residue. They don't actually show the structure usually. But um, normally what they just show is they just say, okay, well, here's ADP, right? Here's ADP. Here's my phosphate, right? And they don't obviously show the mechanism, although it is important, but they just show that they just show, oh, we're just going to phosphorylate, right? Again, I can't stress this enough. That is not what happens, okay? The actual catalytic domain is on the opposite, opposite monomer, right? The catalytic domain of the tyrosine receptor kinase is on the opposite monomer, okay? And so it catalyzes the phosphorylation of, of, the, of the tyrosine residues on the opposite beta subunit. So... Again, when you're looking at these videos on YouTube, be very careful because even in other videos that are not tyrosine kinase receptor related, uh, there are incorrect things that are on there, okay? Um, but from a biochemical standpoint, this is essentially what happens, okay? And in a later video, we'll talk about what happens when IRS1 binds and, and the various biosignaling events that occur with insulin binding, okay? So I hope this video helped, and later videos will do that. See you in the next video.